मैं स्क्रीन शेयर कर दूं क्या राइट बिस्मिल्लाहिर्रहमानिर रहीम थैंक यू फॉर टू एवरीवन फॉर जॉइनिंग इन एंड थैंक्स अ लॉट टू डॉक्टर असद जमान फॉर टेकिंग टाइम आउट एंड गिविंग अस द ऑपर्चुनिटी टू कनेक्ट विद हिम आई थिंक वी आर गुड टू गो एंड लेट्स अप वी कैन स्टार्ट विद द सेवेंथ लेक्चर सो All right, so I have shared the screen and Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So this is actually the longest um, set of slides I've made. I hope that we will be able to get through it. It's also the most important topic. Uh, okay, so let me just start right away. So this is about three mega events which have shaped our minds, and uh, these three events are one is the emergence of a market society. capitalism which is a very unique and unusual form of organizing society the second is the rejection of religion or the transition to secular morality or secular modernity and the third event is the global conquest uh, which was made by the west of the rest of the world so all of these three events have had major impacts on our ways of thinking and so this is the goal of this lecture to cover so there is a interesting uh, verse in urdu that main khayal hu kisi aur ka mujhe sochta koi aur hai that i am the idea of somebody else but somebody else is thinking me so what we think are our thoughts are not actually our thoughts but they have been fed into our minds and this is very important to understand and because this is the greatest barrier to progress and that is the colonized minds this is a general process that ibn khaldun noted that when um, it was in those times it was the muslims who were conquering and when they we conquered some nation then the inhabitants would always uh, acquire extraordinary respect for the conquerors and they would try to imitate their every habit so now in the, uh, the reversal has occurred because the west has hegemony so ataturk in turkey passed laws that forced men to wear hats and suits and uh, and uh, forbade the wearing of uh, these uh, turbans which like the one that i'm wearing right now uh, some people were hanged because they refused to take off their uh, um uh, sarik and their hats uh, their their islamic Uh, dress and the women uh, they were also forced to wear skirts so there were soldiers in the streets who would cut off the uh, the floor length dresses in order to convert them into uh, skirts ataturk translated the novels and he introduced dancing and music into universities uh, at the same time japan which had also lost world war 2 they translated maths engineering medicine and technical books and they sent students by the thousands to universities to western universities to get technical knowledge so they rose to the top in gdp per capita while um, uh, the turks learned how to dance and sing so uh, basically the goal of our lecture is that we should learn to recognize ourselves self knowledge is the most important um, because knowledge begins with self knowledge as ancient philosopher said that knowing yourself is the beginning of wisdom an examined life is not worth it worth living and uh, sheikh ibn al arabi muhyiddin ibn al arabi said that man arafa nafsahu arafa rabbuh or 
one that who has no knowledge of himself he has no knowledge of his lord so knowing yourself is very important now uh, we have been conditioned by our education into the believing the enlightenment of rationality that all knowledge comes from looking at the facts and using reason and we reject all traditions all received knowledge yani whatever our elders say and whatever the respected uh, people in the field say that doesn't matter we should think everything from first principles on our own and because this uh, lesson has been taught to us in our universities we believe ourselves that we are very logical and rational people and all of the opinions that we have are our own opinions and we have derived them by studying facts and using our logic but this is not true logic and uh, empirical evidence is not the source of opinion so we need to learn the source of our own opinion to under, in, in order to understand our own self you should understand that there is too much knowledge to assess our collective heritage the knowledge which is in possession of mankind it has been gathered by hundreds of thousands of scholars over thousands of years uh there is a calculation that about 130 million books have been published so far and it would take 60000 years to read all those books so obviously we cannot acquire all of this knowledge and we cannot examine all of this the vast majority of this knowledge there we have no options we must rely on authority we read a book we don't start uh deriving everything from scratch we just accept that this is written in a textbook and it's written by a respected author so it must be true we just can't we don't have time in our lives to examine everything so that means that 99.9% of the knowledge that all of us have is things that we have just accepted on authority we have not examined it now despite this we have the illusion of choice <clears throat> we 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 look at five different opinions and we select one of them and we say look i chose this opinion on the basis of reason and on the basis of evidence but this is not how really how our minds and hearts work actually we have uh, something which is called confirmation bias our heart likes something and so in the five opinions we pick the one that appeals to our heart and we reject the ones that don't appeal to our heart so the evidence and the logic is not the what convinces us rather our heart has already made a choice and then we find the evidence and the logic which suits our hearts and if we look at how social media works everybody forwards messages which are in agreement with his views and uh, discards messages which are in disagreement without actually examining either of them so this leads to self deception that uh, we we because we select among five different opinions we say oh he is right and he is wrong so we think that we are making the choice and we are freely choosing and we are deciding on the basis of our reason and because of looking at the facts when this is not true actually our heart is making the choices and the evidence is we we select the evidence which favors us when we ignore the things that go against our uh, prejudices so what we think of as our own opinion is not really our own we choose our opinions from a menu of choices and we are not aware of the options which are outside this menu and thinking out out of the box if you say all of the as received knowledge is wrong and i am going to develop a third way this is not easy to do not feasible there is too much knowledge to rethink all of it so we should, we, we don't do that actually so we are unable to think of the out of the box and nor should we most of the time we should just follow authority but sometimes we have to think things through on our own so the difficult solution to this problem of how do we discover the biases in our own mind there are two ways actually i'm going to only talk about one of them but one of them is really to listen to other people who have different views and put aside your own prejudices and opinions and and uh place yourself in the shoes of the other person and learn to think so uh, that will give you an outsider's perspective what what you are like 
but that's uh, uh, something uh, for uh, later. Uh, the other way is to step outside the streams of history. Watch uh, what is happening. So you see, uh, on, on a personal level, you can see that if you have a child and he was brought up in an uh, abusive family, his uh, father used to beat him heavily, then he will absorb the lessons and uh, his character will be shaped by this, even though he may not realize that what he is doing is due to the influence of uh, the childhood he has had. And we all understand this. And exactly like this, the big tides of history shape our thoughts, uh, all of our thoughts, without our actually understanding or knowing. So you're flowing along in the river, just like the fish, and you're not aware of the water that is around you. All right, so there is something which is called the archaeology of knowledge invented by French philosopher Michel Foucault. This is an extremely important method that basically we dig into the foundations of knowledge. Where did this idea come from that is in our minds? So we treat ideas not as this is my idea, I own it and I'll die for it, but rather you examine it from an outsider's perspective. Okay, this idea is in the brain of person X, but where did he get this idea from? So you trace, oh, this came from, he got this from person Y, who got it from person Z, sort of like the chain of narrators in Hadith, but in sort of a different context that where did this idea originate first in the history of mankind, then how was it transmitted? And then what happened to it in the course of its journey? So this is the archaeology of knowledge, very important methodology for getting to understand who we are. And so the first mega event was global colonization and conquest. And uh, uh, the West Europeans had control of about 90% of the globe at the beginning of the 20th century. So this is a traumatic event. This event meant um, that 90% of the world was under the control of a handful of people from a small continent. So this had a massive impact both on the minds of the conquerors and on the minds of the losers. The conquerors acquired a huge superiority complex and also they made up philosophies to justify uh, their contest, their, con uh, their conquest. They, they uh, had to justify it because it was very brutal and ruthless and they had to kill millions of people and treat millions very horribly. And so human beings are born with uh, hearts and these hearts need justif justification to should tell them that what you're doing seems to be evil, but it is not. So, so that was one thing and Edward Said's book Orientalism traces the impact of this colonization on the West itself, and it explains how the West acquired a superiority complex. But we are interested in the other angle, that the colonizers uh, conquered our minds. This is very important to understand that colonization does not take place by guns. As it requires, you know, you can, a handful of people can't conquer and hold a territory of millions of people unless the millions give their assent, they agree and cooperate. And they agree and cooperate because their minds are colonized. And uh, the world views that we have are given to us by the conquerors. So for example, the Eurocentric narrative, which we were taught to believe that the whole world was primitive and savages and barbarians, and they were the civilized people. But the reality of this is that they were the ones who were killing and murdering and torturing. And uh, other people were living in peace. Uh, the story of Columbus is that he arrived at, uh, uh, in India and some tribes came out with hospitality, with flowers and with, and he said, he wrote in his notes that, oh, these are very nice and peaceful people. And we can, if we just have a few guns, we can enslave all of them. So these were the civilized people and the uh, rest of the world was savage and barbarians. That's the narrative that we have been taught to believe because that's what justifies their, their uh, conquest. So why did the West uh, conquer the world? 
And why are we, why are they developed and advanced and uh, civilized? And why are we in the East backwards and ignorant and uncivilized? Uh, and we are, why are we poor and why are they rich and why are they we powerless and they are powerful? Well, there is a whole host of books which uh, have exactly these ideas that I have written. Uh, Max Weber and Edward Landers, major famous historians have written books which say these things which I'm summarizing here that the West rose because people in the West are honest and they are thrifty and they have initiative and they're creative and they have respect for property rights and they're open to new ideas and they are uniquely capable of rational thought. They have science and technology, they have democracy, they have good governance. And what about us? We in the East are dishonest, we are spendthrifts, we are lazy, we steal from each other, we are closed and narrow-minded, we are superstitious, we are irrational, we don't have the capability of thinking scientifically and our governments are always bad and have despotic rulers. So this is the uh, narrative that we have. This, this is what has been drummed into our minds. And everybody from top to bottom believes this sometimes 99%, sometimes 1%. So to the extent that you are free of this, you have liberated your mind, but very few people are. So the story they tell us about why did, uh, why did uh, Europe actually go out and conquer the world? So they tell us that it's the white man's burden. You see this uh, poor uh, famished uh, Bangladeshi woman, she is carrying a white man on, in a basket on her back. That is the white man's burden. Uh, that's not uh, the, the meaning of the phrase is that they conquered the globe out of a sense of responsibility. They had such an advanced civilization which had science and technology and progress and everything good. And all around the world, there was ignorance and superstition and darkness. So they made the supreme sacrifice. They left their comfortable homes and lives and families and they went out in the world to spread their benefits of their civilization to all of humanity. So that's the story of the white man's burden, which we have been taught to believe. So this is actually poison in our minds and we need antidotes for it. We need to detoxify our brains of these Eurocentric narratives. So what is the, uh, what are the, some of the antidotes? Well, we need to look at the horrors of colonization, how actually colonization took place because this has been suppressed. There are this is not what we learned that the Bel in Belgian Congo, half a million people died because of the colonization. Millions of people were, uh, yeah, they, they had a need of labor to, they forced uh, the population to work as, to produce rubber. And when they, uh, when, and they would hold their families hostage and the man would go out and he would, he had to fulfill a quota. He had to produce enough rubber if he didn't pr produce enough rubber, their hands would be chopped off and they would be left to bleed in front of their families. And this is just one example out of yani, hundreds and thousands of super atrocities, which you can't imagine, yani, you can't think of how inhuman this is, but they were the civilized people and we were the savages and the barbarians. So in order to detoxify our minds, we need to learn the history written from the point of view of the people who lost. There is this wonderful book called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by D. Brown, written from the Red Indian, from the Native American perspective of what happened to them in the process of colonization by Americans. There is the story uh, the book titled Massacres to Mining, which tells about the genocide of the uh, Aboriginal population in uh, Australia. There is this book called Web of Deceit, which shows, you see the British uh, tell the world that we were the civilized people. They, yes, the Dutch, they were very bad and the Germans, they were very bad and the French, they were very bad in, in their colonies, but we were gentlemen and we were, uh, so we behaved very civilly. This is just a uh, falsehood and uh, it's just a, a painting and a cover. And there's this fourth book called uh, The American Empire and it exp uh, explains what the Americans have done. And these are just, this is just the tip of the iceberg. 
the amount of atrocity that has been done in the process of uh, colonization is unimaginable. Uh, and yet, you know, the, the great, you know, the amazing thing is that, see, if five people go out and pick up uh, guns, any, what, what, what the French did in, um, in Libya was so amazing uh, that uh, it was not Libya, it was uh, uh, another country. So uh, the colonized people, they, they lost, they, they, they would torture and kill. So if one of their descendants went and uh, shot a few Frenchmen, this is hardly surprising, but that makes a world news. Whereas the atrocities that they did in Algeria uh, are not even known to most people. So uh, those are things, ancient things in the past. In order to really get understanding, we have to look at what happened today and uh, just look at what happened uh, to understand the white man's burden. Look at what happened in Iraq. What was the story that was told, the white man's burden, you know, America was going to go and protect the world from weapons of mass destruction. And they were protecting the cit citizens from an evil dictator who was causing so much harm. And they were going to bring the citizens the benefit of democracy and progress. This was all uh, explicit. He said, even the soldier said that they thought they, we are going to go and help the citizen, liberate them and give them freedom. And they found out that that was not really the purpose uh, when they tried to do some things like that. The reality is that the complete destruction of Iraqi society and economy, more than a million civilians killed, hospitals, schools, factories, roads, infrastructure destroyed. Why? So that the corporations could get contracts for rebuilding Iraq. These contracts were being signed before the invasion began, multi-million dollars that after you... Huh? At, after you destroy them, then um, you, will, um, you will get the chance to rebuild Iraq. So look at the cover story and look at the reality. This is exactly the reality of the white man's burden. So we have uh, come across the question, why are they rich and why are we poor? Well, that's because they are honest and they are smart and they are intelligent and we are not. But actually uh, there is this book Ellis Stavrianos, Lefkin Stavrianos, Global Rift, The Third World Called Comes of Age. Now, interestingly, this is the only book which tells the story and it's out of print. Even though it's a very, very influential book, many people who have read it said that it changed their uh, view of the world. And basically what he says is that development and underdevelopment are opposite sides of the same coin. Uh, they became rich because they looted the world and we became poor because of the same reason. Uh, there is nothing very, and hundreds of books have been written. Why is the West rich and why these hundreds of books literally trying to explain it from cultural factors, from geographic factors. But the very simple idea that they looted the world and they became rich and we became poor, this is not present in any of them. So then why did the West co colonize the East? Well, there is a historical pattern which Ibn Khaldun has mentioned that barbarians invade and conquer civilized uh, nations when the civilizations become degenerate. In the Europe, there was three centuries of continuous warfare uh, while the rest of the world was at peace. So they acquired uh, advantage in, in military tactics. They learned uh, uh, strategies. And the other thing was the development of uh, Machiavellian thought that ev all is fair in pursuit of power and ethics are for the weak. So people who have analyzed this in detail, very serious and very well-known famous historians say that the West did not conquer the world due to superiority in uh, science and technology and weaponry. They conquered because of a comparative advantage in ruthlessness. They were so yani, um, brutal and unimagined because they really thought the rest of the world was, was uh, like animals and they treated the rest of the world like animals. Whereas when a, a human being meets other human beings, then there is a certain amount of decency and respect that you have to give, which means that you cannot actually do anything you like for power. So the third thing, uh, the, the, the second uh, major event that we um, 
has shaped our minds was the European transition to secular modernity. They rejected God, afterlife, day of judgment, and consequently, morality. And this uh, immorality, uh, which is built into their curriculum, you see, if you look at all of the books that you have read in your university, there is chemistry and biology and physics and mathematics, but nobody teaches you that it would be wrong to drop a bomb and destroy a city and kill millions of people. That's not taught. They will teach you how to build an atom bomb, the physics of that, but they will not teach you about the morality. So why did Europeans reject religion? Well, again, there is a Eurocentric narrative which says that this was the triumph of reason over superstition and ignorance, that they, they were uh, in the dark ages and then they learned to reason. But the, uh, the truth is that this is not how it happened. Actually, their popes and the church were, uh, churches were striving for power and fighting each other. And uh, they had open displays of luxury, which, uh, and, and there was centuries of religious warfare. And there were barbaric acts committed by kinfolk, by families. And one part would be Protestant, the other part would be Catholic, and they would do really massive damage to each other. So because of these things, people became disgusted with religion and eventually rejected religion. So after rejecting religion, they acquired a new prophet, Jeremy Bentham, and he taught the philosophy of utilitarianism. And he said, you know, all of this Christian morality, that's just junk and garbage. Uh, there is only one morality. Pleasure is good and pain is bad. So anything you do that makes you happy, that's moral. And if something causes you pain, that's immoral. And this uh, religion is built into the theory of economics. The goal of life is the maximization of pleasure. Also, they, this led to individualism. I don't care about anyone else or anything else. The only thing I care about is my pleasure. Hedonism, so pursuit of pleasure, selfishness. You know, what, what good is it to try to help others at self-sacrifice? It only reduces your pleasure. Uh, greed, accumulation of wealth, all of these are results of the transition to secular modernity. So continuous religious warfare in Europe led to a reconceptualization of society. Previously, and in all other cultures, we view the society as a collective, uh, as a collective, like Allah Ta'ala says that you are kuntum khaira ummat. We are an ummah, we are a collective. And that uh, one part of, the, we are like one body. If one place feels pain, then the whole body feels pain. This was actually the natural conception of society all over the world. It was not just um, uh, Europe, everyone where, but in Europe, because of continuous warfare, they said, look, people are always fighting each other. So actually the model of society is that everybody is fighting everybody else. So in this case, what we need to do is impose rule of law. We have to have a very strong government. And basically the goal of society is to prevent war between individuals. It's to provide a, a framework to regulate conflict. And so society, instead of being thought of as one body, it was thought of as a collection of different individuals, different communities with their own goals. And the only way to keep them together is by the government, which must be very forceful and powerful and make sure that uh, the justice is given when two groups are fighting each other. So what this led to was something which is very subtle and strange and has to be understood. And we, can, we are in a better position to understand it than they. You know, we're always talking about freedom, how the West is free. Why free? You know, freedom, it's by itself. And wealth, of course, pursuit of wealth, it also became. So why uh, wealth is actually an intermediate good. It is not a final good. As, um, as it is said that it is not fi nafsihi maqsood. It is li uh, it's, um, it's, uh, you, you want wealth not because you want to eat the money, because you're going to use it for some other purpose. Similarly, freedom is useful if you can use your freedom to do something good. If we say, okay, you are free to kill the other person, then that's not good. Uh, you should not be given that freedom. 
So freedom is only good if it is used to do good things. But because there was no consensus on what is the good thing to do, everybody had their own idea. So they said that, okay, let everybody be free to pursue their own goals and let everybody have wealth so that they can pursue their own goals. But this doesn't mean that freedom and wealth are goals in themselves, but actually it ended up that, in a, in it happened very gradually that ultimately the goal of life was lost and it became that, yes, let freedom be the goal itself and let wealth be the goal itself because life itself is meaningless. There is no higher vision to life. There's no purpose and there's no difference between humans and animals. And that was also part of the biological argument that we are just another kind of an animal. So we should live like animals, uh, pursue pleasure, avoid pain, and uh, nothing will happen to us after death. So all of these are uh, the ideas that are built into the social sciences of the West. And we have absorbed these indirectly because they're not written explicitly in the books. They are all, they are behind the ways of thinking and the philosophy and we absorb them indirectly. So that makes it even more deadly because if you see the poison, then you can avoid it. But if it's hidden inside a sugar coated pill, then you, then you, when you take the pill, it tastes sweet and you don't realize the poison that it contains. So the antidote to this is to focus strongly on the goal of life because the goal of life gives us meaning. Everything that we do should be subordinate to the goal. And Allah Ta'ala tells us that human beings are the best of the creations and every life is infinitely precious. And even every life is potentially equal to the entire humanity. So we understand that our goal is to achieve excellence in conduct and that every human being has the seed to become um, uh, like Al-Ghazali, like uh, Ibn al-Haysam, like Muhyiddin Ibn al-Arabi and all of the great scholars, everyone has the potential to be like that. So basically, life is about trying to develop these capabilities within ourselves. It's not about pursuing pleasure or wealth. And in fact, uh, it is very important to understand that pursuit and pleasure and wealth is counterproductive. It doesn't even bring you pleasure because short-term pleasure, instant gratification actually leads to, is, is a different thing from uh, doing a long-term pleasure or, or happiness. And they are actually uh, in conflict with each other. If you pursue short-term pleasure, instant gratification, you will not be able to achieve happiness. In fact, instant gratification is like a drug. You take the drug and it gives you a shot of happiness but then you become addict and you want more drug and that's the only way to be happy and, and you basically drop out of life. As opposed to this, if you pursue, um, uh, the, the, if you pursue, if you want to get long-term happiness, then you have to build your character and you have to build your social relationships. And this requires sacrifice of short-term pleasure, looking after. If you try to learn how to love others, then you will be loved. And being loved and loving, these are the most... Uh, most uh, satisfying, pleasing experiences for all human beings. And it's nothing like, you know, maximize, uh, no matter how much food you eat, you cannot get the pleasure that you get from uh, good social relationships. So the final event that I would like to talk about is the emergence of capitalism. And this is the uh, transition from a traditional society to a market society, which occurred in Europe. And um, basically in a market society, everything is for sale. So human lives are for sale and we don't realize it, but the labor market is actually a form of wage slavery. We sell our lives in order to earn money so that we can live. This is not the natural way to live. And there are other ways uh, to organize the labor market. And Islam teaches us these ways. And we don't have to sell our lives for labor. And in fact, the initial process by which the labor market was created was enormously cruel. Uh, people were deprived of access to land. And basically, they faced the choice of either starving 
or working in the factories to earn money to be able to provide food for themselves and their children. And that's how the labor market was started. Today, everybody does it and it's so common that we think that it's normal, but it is not. This is not what our lives are meant for. And in fact, uh, we, we learn to believe that our lives for sale for money, but in fact, this is not true. Every human being is infinitely precious and we cannot purchase even one hour of time for all the gold in the world when the time comes for us. Similarly, <clears throat> the planet, the biosphere, the oceans, the atmosphere, the jungles, they are all for sale for money. And um, as a result, we are seeing massive destruction. The oceans are full of plastics and the atmosphere has been become polluted. And uh, so many species have become extinct that the ecologists are calling this the Anthropocene. The human beings have shaped the world and have destroyed, have caused them a massive destruction on the face of the planet so that a climate catastrophe is uh, looming on the horizon. <coughs> and of course, one of the key characteristics of the uh, market society is that money is God. Everybody Yani our lives are meant are for sale for money and the goal of life is to, uh, is to get more money. <coughs> so what are the antidotes to this poison of the market society? <coughs> uh, the ayat of the Quran that whoever saves one life saves all humanity. So we, instead of uh, selling lives, we, we must learn to value lives. We must learn to value the planet which has been given to us. It is a trust from God. And uh, uh, we are supposed to protect it, preserve it, cherish it as a gift from God and pass it on to the next generation in a better condition than what we found it. <clears throat> And the antidote to money is the realization from the Quran that we are all brothers and sisters. All of the creation is the family of God. And those who <clears throat> serve the family of God from the love of God are beloved by God. And so instead of the uh, jungle of competition, which actually corresponds to the process of global conquest, you see, uh, the, when you justify, if you want to justify conquest of the globe, then you have to say that these are the ethics, that uh, the survival of the fittest, whoever is strong, he can take from the weak. As opposed to this, Islam teaches us that the power has been given to you to help the weak and the oppressed. And our societies, Islamic societies, are built on cooperation, on generosity, on social responsibility, the wealthy and the powerful taking care of the poor and the powerless. <clears throat> so, uh, to conclude this talk, we understand that our education, the capitalist education we received, is designed to turn us into human capital. It is designed to turn us into factors for the production of wealth. We, in economics, we write F of K L that the Output is a, uh, is a function of the capital input and the labor input. And who is the labor input? That's you and me. So our education is designed to turn us into parts of a machine. And anything that is unique and individual and, uh, and precious about us, that is sanded out. And we are trained to believe that we are for sale so that we don't realize our true worth. So basically, uh, freeing ourselves from these uh, chains uh, requires learning to think for ourselves. And these chains have been wrapped around our minds. And basically, that's one of the most important things to understand, that the obstacle to progress and development is not that we are poor and we don't have resources and we don't have science and we don't have technology. None of these is the problem. The problem is the enslavement of minds and the solution is to free the minds. And so I think this is my last slide, so I'll conclude here.
Right. right. Uh, thank you so much. That was like uh, 40 minutes of uh, <clears throat> you like uh, simplified such complicated topics in 40 minutes. So we have 20 minutes now for question and answers. Uh, if anyone who wants to ask can please unmute their mic and go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, Dr. Sir, I understand the whole idea you presented, but my question is how to start implementing this uh, ideas you have presented and what can be the a way we, through which we can implement them? Well, yes, as I, I, I discussed this in the last lecture, that start with yourself. Our own mind is colonized and we have to learn to free our mind. And, that, and the best way is to just you say the things that I have said to you this in lecture, just talk, it, talk with it to your neighbor and he will reject what you are saying. He'll say, no, uh, we are not backwards because of, uh, because of anything that the white man did. You are wrong. You should blame yourself. We, we lost because... We are inferior and we are, um, we are uh, lazy and we are stupid and, uh, and they won because they are strong and powerful and intelligent. We should learn to be like them. This is what they will say. I, I know from experience. You try to teach them what I've been saying and you will find that uh, this is very difficult. And, and, but you, you try to explain not for, to convince them. That is very hard to do. But to convince your own self because this weakness exists in our own hearts. We believe this. We have been trained to believe this. We have been conditioned to believe in the Eurocentric narrative. Yes, that they are, the white man is superior and rational and intelligent and we are uh, stupid and superstitious and weak and, and lazy and dishonest and so on. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sahib. Wa alaikum as uh, Thank you for the talk. So on the subject of conquest, Yes. Um, you know, I, I live in India, so we face some of these criticisms that you were mentioning, that there has been also Muslim conquest, which is a large part of it, which spread across a large part of the globe, but particularly the Mughal conquest of India and other maybe Moorish conquest of Spain. So what kind of comparative, uh, what kind of comparisons can we offer? Very good uh, when... question, Saif Ali. Um... There have been a, a, a very nice histories written very recently. I don't have the references on, on my fingertips right now, but uh, people have explained that the Muslim conquests were not of uh, the type. Yani actually, this, this is a problem created by the British rewriting of history, uh, the divide and conquer strategy. Actually, Muslims and Hindus lived together in peace the conquests were political and um, yani they were Hindu Rajas and um, Muslim Rajas. Uh, these were, uh, they were uh, cooperating against each other and so on, Sikhs and so on. So the, the, the wars did not occur because of religious bias and there was no colonization. Uh, in fact, the kings took care of the public and it was deemed their social responsibility. So when the British Empire took, there were many people who wrote to the Queen of England in the impression that the Queen of England would help the public against their rulers, but they were disappointed. But, but this was the tradition that the people, uh, that the king was responsible for the people and the people were um, uh, in turn uh, responsible to the king. So anyway, the history has been very distorted and it has been painted to look like the Muslims were ruthless conquerors and they were opposed to Hindus and they were, they were killing and destroying and looting. And this is not true. And now there exist very good histories, which in fact, uh, some of them which, uh, which have been written, there were strikes by Indians and Hindus that this is uh, distorting our past because they said that, you know, this is all a myth that uh, Muslims were invaders and conquerors. So you need to read those histories. Yes, let's go to Lisa Listiana. Um, Jazakallah Khair, uh, Prof. Asad, for the inspiring session. Uh, actually, I have two questions, Prof. So 
The first one is um, regarding to our necessity to reject the Western uh, social science, as you uh, explained in previous uh, lectures. So do you think that we, we, we shall have different approach in doing research to develop the useful knowledge? Because you previously also mentioned about the to differentiate which is useful and not useful knowledge. Yes, definitely. Uh, you see, basically the recreation of social science will be done on the basis of the assumption that human beings have brains, but they also have hearts and souls. The Western social science is built on the idea that human beings have brains only. They have no hearts and they have no souls. And so once you model the human being as uh, a, 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 someone with heart and soul, then you immediately get a new basis, a new foundation for all of social science. So that's, uh, and that is definitely something we need to do desperately because uh, currently the only textbooks available in the world are the Western ones. So regardless of what you do, you will end up teaching their books. So we need to write our own books, which explain the true nature of human being from the Islamic perspective, and then built the whole theory of economics and psychology and sociology and anthropology around the idea that all human beings are brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. So there is no intrinsic differences like, you know, the anthropologists say, you know, this culture, they are completely different from the West and that culture, uh, that's completely, no, everybody is human being. We're all, all uh, brothers and sisters and uh, these small divisions of language, race, color, these do not come in the path of our uh, essential uh, being the same family. So social science developed on the idea that humanity is one family. Uh, this is sorely needed today. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, may I have another question? One, one other yeah, question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so uh, uh, there are several maybe uh, Islamic university that using the, uh, to promote the integration of knowledge. So uh, which, which believe that we should not uh, recheck all as long as they align with Islamic principles. So what is your opinion on this? Yes, you see, I have uh, been battling for 10 years with these people. Uh, it is definitely a correct idea that we should take what is good and reject what is wrong. But the problem is that the judgment is not there. When they, they say that we should accept what is correct and reject what is wrong, they end up accepting all of economic theory as being correct because uh, they uh, because of the colonized mind, we uh, because of the use of the, even the word social science, you see, it's a deception. It says that social science, the theory of the supply and demand is just like the law of uh, gravity, the law of, supply, law of supply and demand, in the, even though it's not. Supply and demand is just a, a, a fake theory, but the use of the word science and uh, very uh, fancy mathematics uh, and then our uh, sense of inferiority convinces us that, that whatever they are saying, they, it is right. Then we must modify the Quran and the Hadith to fit into their framework. So in, in practice, it is true. But what happens is that if you really uh, look at the body of Western knowledge uh, in the social sciences, then maybe out of 100 things, you can pick out 10 things which are correct and reject 90 of them. But what is happening in these institutes in universities like IIUM or IIUI, uh, you take 90% of what the West says as correct and uh, reject 10%. And then you say that, yes, we have accepted all the truth. So it's, it's, uh, that's, that's what's the problem that because we are in shock and awe of the West, we cannot evaluate their teachings in the correct manner which it is required to do. All right, so shall we go to Salman Tahir? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum as um, Sir, I've been your uh, student at LAMS, so I've been following your work for some time now. Um, and um, as you had asked in the last session, uh, that, you know, my, the, the, uh, every individual has to work within his or her own domain. So my question is related to my own domain of work, uh, which is that in your previous session, you have highlighted that Western ideals for economy are competition and free markets, while Islamic ideals are 
uh, cooperation and social welfare. So my first question is, do you think uh, competitive business organizations who are aiming to earn halal profits are possible in that Islamic ideal of the economy that you are proposing? I'm asking because I had an uh, I had an impression that you're allowing for social welfare organizations only. Uh, my second question is that if you think that such organizations uh, should be part of uh, the Islamic ideal, then are there any available models of the same that you think uh, can and should be replicated? Thank you so much. Yes, there are many, many uh, models for um, Basically, there's this whole line of thinking called social investment and uh, socially oriented organizations, which are now coming into being. After looking at the deadly, uh, devastating effects of uh, uh, corporate search for profits, the whole global financial crisis was caused by greed of, uh, of uh, financial institutions, which without any hesitation, they uh, took all the life savings of millions of people in order to make profits. And you know, this Nestle company, it's selling milk powder for decades to people knowing that their children are likely to die because uh, if, they're, if they're weaned away from uh, mother's milk uh, onto bottle feed. So this, this idea that everyone should just pursue their own selfish interest has been shown to be enormously destructive. In fact, the whole climate change and the destruction and loss and the potential catastrophe that all of humanity faces is due to this individualistic thinking without any social responsibility. So not only is it possible, but everybody is thinking about it, but we are in a better position to start. And there are many, many practical examples. I just, uh, Yani, for example, in Pakistan, we have Indus Hospital. This is just one random place where millions of rupees are spent. Any patient can walk in and get the most advanced treatment without, uh, yani, there's no cashier. You don't have a cash register. So this is the ideal which many people are implementing in private on their own. Look at Edhi, uh, that the, the, our goal of our lives is to serve humanity, not to extract money from their miseries, which is what, so uh, people who, uh, take up this. So individually, I can uh, cite thousands and thousands of examples. The, the thing is that if if there are so many, once, once this gets started, once these little pieces start linking together and acquiring strength, then this will reflect in the social fabric as well. But definitely there is uh, examples available, models for us to follow everywhere in, in lots of areas. And it's not just in the Islamic countries. Everywhere people are thinking how to uh, behave social in a way which is socially responsible. Many books, many articles, many practical examples. I see Saif Ali is hands up. Is that, are you still have a question? Uh, I just wanted to make a point regarding Salman's thing that it, it's not really comparable. You know, the, simply the social welfare, You, from the Islamic standpoint, you have to think about the reason for the social welfare because uh, many social welfare organizations exist because they want to pursue sustainability without any conception of God or the Akhira. Uh, whereas a social welfare organization that takes it up for, for another reason is it's two entirely different things. So the transferring the model is not sufficient in my opinion, but uh, perhaps Dr. Saab, you can... You can uh, that's a very good, very good remark, Saif Ali. The, Allah Ta'ala says about the, they feed the poor for the sake of the love of Allah. So it's not just feeding the poor that's needed, but actually doing it for the sake of love of Allah. Thinking of the whole planet as a trust, as a, as a gift from God, which we have to treat with love and respect. And thinking of all of the creation of God as the family. And this creation includes the animals and the species. So this, this spirit is different from just uh, sustainable development, trying to maximize growth while making sure that the planet doesn't sink. Yes, it's a very different way of thinking. All right, so I think right. there are no more questions, so we should um, Would. stop here. Right. Okay. So 
thank you so much for every, uh, everyone for participating in the lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rasad, for, uh, for your opinions. Uh, the previous lectures content and presentations are available on the site. Uh, also, today's uh, presentation was emailed to everyone. Who, uh, if someone has not received it, they can go to the site and uh, uh, download it. So I think that's about it. Thank you so much. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.